that big right. room. This, this woman back here is Rory Lightos. Jeff, and thanks so much to all of you for coming tonight. Um, before I start, um, I really want to just take a moment uh, uh, to remember Earl Exum, who um, died uh, unexpectedly in the last, uh, I think, on Sunday. And uh, he was so interested in the history of West Hartford, and we had so many conversations about um, not only the history, but uh, what about the history should be taught. Um, and as I was thinking about this today, I was just imagining him. It would be not unlike him to just come around the corner and sit in that uh, back seat back there. Um, and so uh, just uh, maybe a moment of silence to remember all he offered to this community. Thank you. Okay, so um, I want to start by recognizing and extending gratitude to the indigenous peoples who for many years stewarded the land we occupy today. Being a descendant of white settler colonists, I also wish to acknowledge this country's legacy of colonialism and the subjugation and exploitation of people and our earth that continues to this day. We live on the homeland of the Sikiog, uh, speakers of the Algonquin, Algonquin language. We are also on the land of the Wangunk and Tunxis, also Algonquin speakers. My work today, um, for those of you certainly who know me, uh, would know this is not at all to make people feel guilty about what their ancestors did, and at the same time, we do not want to build on those institutions that oppressed. Recovering this history helps build understanding and can support a healing process. It helps to know the backstory to address present day issues. I've been studying and writing articles about West Hartford history for at least 30 years. 
And I've written only one on the topic of Indians, and that on King Philip and whether we should have a school named after him. It's the only article in my book uh, that the Noah Webster House published in 2018. But he never lived here. Uh, this is an issue of a naming in the 1950s, which included the naming of almost 20 streets after Indian tribes, many not local. I didn't start to look at a more local history of indigenous people until about five years ago, when a fifth grade teacher at Charter Oak School asked me what I could share with her students on local native history. I started collecting documents and have a file now of more than 120 slides that help to tell a story of the presence of the Sikiyag, Wangang, and Tungsis, as well as the Quinnipiac who lived and visited this place. This talk is really a first draft, so you have to give me some slack here, um, of this history, and I hope you'll be willing to ask questions and offer insights as I talk today. So my big goal today is to address indigenous erasure, erasure here in West Hartford. How do we tell a narrative inclusive of the people who lived here before colonization and after? What stories need to be told and retold? Reflecting on my time as town historian and chronicler of West Hartford history, I've tried to give voice to women, African Americans, and everyday citizens who've, whose voices have not been part of the narrative we tell about ourselves. This opportunity tonight helps to give voice to indigenous people that change the narrative of our town. Giving voice, telling a complete history, cognizant that native people, um, that will help change the story we tell about West Hartford. Okay, I think this is on. Okay, so um, the impetus for this talk is the West Hartford Indigenous Recognition and Reconciliation Task Force, which was established, Adrian, am I right, in June of this year? Is that when the task force started? Um, uh, I might also uh, think of this as, a, as reckoning and repair, and it's sort of interesting, the words of recognition and reconciliation, and often people use the terms reckoning and repair. Um, and you can see there's uh, quite a variety of people on this group, and uh, many, uh, several Native people who, who live uh, in this town, though not descendants of uh, the three groups that uh, lived here in the 17th and 18th century. Our goal, uh, one of our first goals was to get a land acknowledgement for the town of West Hartford. And, um, and then as a task force, we sort of thought, well, that can't be our end point here. Um, we really need to think about um, yes, a land acknowledgement, but how do, how do we uh, tell the story here on a local level? Um, and I guess that's where I, um, um, I certainly would not call myself a historian of indigenous people here, but as a town historian, I do feel like I, I have my lane here. Uh, you know, what actually happened um, in, on, this, on this land here? Okay, so um, these are my four questions that I'm hoping to address today and I hope will open up more research and uh, discussion about uh, the people who lived here. So who lived here, who controlled the land, how did indigenous people interact with colonizers, and what responsibilities do we have today? So when I started doing this research, I called Sheila Daly, who is the archivist here, and I said, what do you have in the house, in the archives, um, that is uh, from Native Americans who um, lived in Connecticut or, or lived here? And she said, I don't think we have anything. Um, and um, then she did more research, and she found um, this basket, which is actually out in the, um, in the old kitchen, um, whose provenance shows that uh, it was made here in New England sometime between 1890 and 1920. Right? And 
Um, at first, I was uh, surprised. Um, but then I thought, this is, this is really perfect to start with because so much of the history that's been written about New England is that uh, 1616, there was an epidemic. 90% of the native population died. Then there were wars in the, 16th, in the 17th century. And there really were no native people left. And she tells me that this was made here a uh, hundred years ago by a native person. Um, and so that helps to sort of shift our gaze a little bit about the fact that um, native people still live among us today. And then as I was doing research, uh, it was sort of cool to find this. Uh, this is a Pequot uh, woman, basket maker, uh, about 80 years ago. And look at the similarities between those two baskets. It's pretty cool. OK. OK, so who lived here first? Um, this, okay, this is a 15-second uh, um, uh, movie. Um, and it was uh, produced by a woman named Darlene Kasak, who works at the American Institute for American uh, American American There's a lot of A's and I's, yes, in Washington, Connecticut. And she's uh, working uh, to, uh, with people from the other um, uh, native groups in, in uh, the state to develop a curriculum for the public schools by, by public law. Um, and this, she said, you have to use this because this is what we're, we're sending to all the schools. And so you'll see three different slides. This is um, who lived here first. And then uh, you'll, see, um, you'll see the towns, and then you'll see the reservations. So it's kind of neat. This is pre-colonial, pre-contact. Colonizers. And we have. Can you stop that for a second? I just want to point something out. Um, where, where do you want me to stop? The last slide where it shows Golden Hill Pagasa, um, the amount of land they all have. Mm -hmm. I just want everyone to take note that Golden Hill Pagasa, which is down in the Bridgeport area, Trumbull now, they have a quarter of an acre left. Mm -hmm. A quarter of an acre of their original um, that's not really what it's like where they've been for the last couple hundred years. It's not even their original, original land. Down Sea, Trumbull, a quarter of an acre. Yeah. Uh, but they have now they also have in Colchester, Colchester, yeah. Colchester, but, but this so is a quarter a acre. Time, that's all they have. Yeah. Um, it's been, go ahead. Um, they do not have a reservation today because they got, yes, yeah, so. Um, it's interesting on her map that the Sikiog do not appear right. on her map. So I asked her why, but she didn't reply. So I don't know that yet. That's hard for her, right? Sikiog yeah. is what we're Yeah. Talking, so. So, yes. Has the controversy dispute with the Shadikok been resolved? The Shadikok? Yeah. They're not a federal tribe, just like the Golden Pagasset are not either. Are you referring uh -huh. to the Yeah, it, it, there's, a, there's a rule that says if you apply once to get federal recognition and you don't get it, that you can't apply again. That's a recent rule that our senators supported. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, it, here, politically, it was tied to the casinos. Like that was the whole, uh, at least from my point of view, that was the. OK, let's see if I can get this to move now. Nope. Hmm. I might have to escape. Go to, oh, yeah. OK. Uh, 
Can I get it back to full screen? Not yet, but you will. Uh, okay. Um, so um, these next three slides show uh, who lived here pre-contact. And I've drawn in in red approximately the uh, borders of Hartford and West Hartford. And you can see uh, uh, Wangong, Sikiog, and Tunxis. Um, and then the next slides will show you exactly where they are. But uh, one of the really interesting things is that the borders overlap. And uh, you'll notice that when you look at another map as well. So these are the Sikiog. And the, it's confusing because the settlement itself, um, and Judy will correct me if I don't say this appropriately, but the, the is Sukyog, and then the people are the Sikiog, sometimes the Sayakog, sometimes the Sequin, uh, but on this particular site, which is um, by, uh, uh, it's an open source by native people, uh, this is the way they define them. Uh, this is the Tunxus. So again, you can see it overlaps. And so by the 1640s, the Tunxus have about uh, between 100 and 150 people. The Sikiog are in like the teens uh, as far as the number of people. And then the Wangunk, who are a really large group. They're called the Connecticut River Indians, and they're mostly um, centered in area but around Middletown and Portland, but have some control all the way to the north. And uh, one of the people I read was a man named Timothy Ives, um, and he uh, talked about how these um, groups of people were not socially bounded. They interfaced with each other throughout their history. And um, they, um, they actually sort of had, uh, they had connections with all these other uh, groups. So I think that's part of the overlapping. And uh, in his uh, paper, he made this uh, web of social interactions to show how much um, and who, how, how much interaction there was, and you get an idea of who they were the closest to. Can you comment on the language, their, their similarities in language? <coughs> I don't know. I mean, it's alcohol, yes. And I, yeah, I, I guess I just haven't read about that, but um, yeah, I'm just they, there seemed to be a lot of communication, and um, the Wangunk pre contact were polygynous, and so there are examples of men who uh, were married to a woman who was a Quinnipiac, a woman who was a Wangunk, and a woman who was a Tunxis. And it seemed as though the women actually controlled the land, but these men moved between these three different areas. Um, and so that's part of that, um, that social interaction. Now this uh, is a map that is based on treaties. Um, and what do you notice that's different about this map than the others that you just saw as far as the boundaries are concerned? Okay, much more that's yeah. that, yeah. Yes, there, there's a line. <laughs> Um, and that's a really European thing. Um, and in fact, the treaty that gave the land we stand on now uh, to the English, you know, they drew lines uh, that went six miles west of uh, the Connecticut River. Um, and then uh, there was a treaty for the Tunxus in Farmington as well. So you can see here, uh, you can see the Sikiog here. And uh, so that's between Windsor and Wethersfield. 
And this is just a, a blow up of that same map. Um, and so this, um, this uh, map maker has called uh, Sukiog, the town. And when I look at this, um, and Finn may correct me here also, um, that seems to me to be in the area now where Prospect Avenue and Farmington Avenue meet. And you can see all of these, uh, these are all Indian trails here. And it makes me think that, you know, here is where the English and the Dutch first settled in the 1630s. And West Hartford is settled in the 1670s, but the first settlers here were along this ridge that we're on now on Main Street. And so I just wonder if part of that is that there was still a native presence um, in this area when that happened. Um, and it would be interesting if there was ever any archaeological digs around there too. I don't know. What do you think, Finn? Do you think that's in Hartford? Or do you think that can partly be in West Hartford? Can we claim part of it? It's tough to tell because I'm, I was trying to look at that existing trail coming up from like the present Farmington area, and I thought that fo it looks like it follows along Farmington Ave, but I, yeah. it's tough to tell. It might be, I mean, the map's the whole state, so maybe it's kind of generic. Mm -hmm. But it looks like it's around the present border between West Hartford and Hartford. Yeah. I, I just can't tell, yeah, specifically where. But, So um, another big thing that historians talk about is, well, it, is that uh, what, what was this land when the colonizers came? And I think most of us learned in school that they moved into a wilderness, right? It was sort of untouched land. And um, the historiography now talks about the colonizers moving into managed land. Um, that the people who lived here were farmers, uh, that they hunted, they fished, they burned forests. Um, and so um, this was no wilderness. Uh, this was, uh, and the native uh, people were managing the land. And one way they've done it, this is just a small example of it, is by looking at the language and um, the names they called uh, the, the times of year. Um, and uh, this is Roger Williams writing in the 1640s, um, spring or seed time, right? So there's farming. Uh, and up here it says, uh, the harvest last. Um, and so, you know, people have really studied the language to uh, recreate uh, more about, you know, without being an archeologist, this is another way to uh, find out about the culture. Well, so I, I would just add, and I don't, I'm curious how this fits. I know I read, I was doing some research at one point, and I know I read in something from the Connecticut Historical Society. Um, I'm curious what, if this makes sense to everybody, but the comment, the, the observation shared in that, I cannot remember what that paper was, but they said, you know, the Sakya, the um, like there's something even in that name, right? That talks about like the bend in the river, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and so that was where seasonally they would spend time there, and then and then the woodland that is now West Hartford was where they would move seasonally to seek protection and mm -hmm. cover in, in certain months. And I mean, I'm just drawn also, like of course like the unmanaged landscape, I mean, but keep in mind, they're, the way they, they conduct, you know, the way they farm is completely different than the way, you know, we as an American culture farm. So it did look, I mean, I think it was very wooded still, you know, and, and I love, you know, it's, it mean, it's meaningful, it's by the seasons, you know, that mm -hmm. they mean things, you know, yeah. meaning by the seasons is so beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, and this, again, comes from the Institute for American Indian Studies. These are recreations they have made there. Um, and uh, Kim was talking about uh, this would be a summer home, um, this a winter home. Um, and 
uh, it could have been inland into the Connecticut River, but it also could have been inland into the shore, um, which there's evidence of that as well. Okay, how and why did uh, land move from the Sikiog to the colonizer settlers? Okay, so um, this map uh, was actually drawn in 1914, um, and it's describing uh, the English and Dutch settlement here. But there's a lot of little details that give us some hints as to why in 1636 the Sikiog would have turned over or would have traded their land uh, with the English. And so if you see the, you can see the orange arrows which show uh, the Sakyog here in the South Meadows and then in the North Meadows. Um, and then um, the purple shows uh, the settlement of the Dutch. Dutch Point, you may be familiar with that in uh, Hartford. Uh, this is called Dutch Island here. Um, and then uh, the English in green. Uh, this gives them a way to the river here that the Dutch sort of controlled. Uh, there's a fort there. And then, uh, to me, most interestingly, is uh, the Pequot. So um, here, down in the South Meadow, the Pequot sort of have a beachhead here. And um, just before the settlement in the 1630s, the Pequot had fought with the Sikiog three times and beat them in battle three times. And now they're settling here. And so I, um, at least from what I've read, um, this uh, gave impetus for the Sikiog to look for an ally. Um, and uh, they found that ally uh, in the English. Tracy, what brought the Well, they're trying to control the trade. So at this point, uh, there's a big fur trade going on, and uh, they want to control the trade. So in 1636, uh, they negotiate a treaty, which doesn't exist. Um, uh, but from the 1670 treaty, uh, they're recounting what the 1636 treaty said. And it, it transferred all the land from the Sikiog to the English colonizers, six miles west of the Connecticut River, bounded by Wethersfield and Windsor. Um, and um, the, uh, the guy who, um, who's sort of the main leader, according to the English, is a man named Sequassin. And um, he's, uh, he's negotiating. But if you look at that paper that's on your seat, you might have a, um, these are the, uh, uh, these are the people who signed this treaty. And uh, the treaty, of course, has been uh, transcribed. Um, and, um, and you can see uh, Sequassin's name. Uh, it's spelled different ways, but here, Sunquassin, Sunquassin Indian Treaty. Um, and uh, here's the six miles. Uh, they pass over all their right and interest to the lands. Um, and uh, the treaty goes on. One of the interesting points in the treaty is that they mention that a woman named Wawarme is there who is the only living heir of Sequassin. So she was there to be, um, you know, to give legitimacy to what was happening. Uh, but one of the interesting things I find when I look at the people who signed it was um, there are four women who signed this treaty. And uh, it seems really clear that women um, had political power and they had power uh, over land as well. Um, and so uh, you can uh, look on the sheet you have and the women are denoted by a word we don't use today, um, squaw. 
And uh, that's a way you can tell uh, that they're women. Um, one of the things I found interesting, too, after the treaty is written, uh, you probably can't read this, but it says the original barks or signatures of the Indians are singular and grotesque. It's like, uh, not really. Some represent implements of war, some wild beasts, beasts, etc. And I looked over and over at it, thinking, what, wh why is that? Uh, why is that what they would note about this? Go ahead. Um, one thing when we read this at home that I can't figure out is what did they get back for the land? When you read it, you're like, okay, so where's the, and so did you make any progress on that since you No. Uh, I just thought someone here made progress. There's some thing we should know. And it's a separate thing. It's like, this all looks so clean and tidy. It's yes. Like, how much duress was there in terms of providing mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. to give them the land? You know, they make it sound like it was so cooperative. Mm -hmm. Well, there was mm -hmm. some protection issue. Like, they wanted some protection. Yes. But it's not nothing, like when you read it, you, you just keep reading, like, what did they get back? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there is some, a couple of things I read. One is that, um, that um, Native people made agreements to um, sort of to share, um, and that perhaps, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, who, who knew English? this well in 1636, let's say. Um, and, uh, but, uh, you know, there are also other people who are saying, um, you know, we sort of make fun of uh, the people who traded Manhattan Island for $24. You know, it's sort of a, uh, a myth that, you know, makes its way down. And so people are trying to talk about, you know, what, the intentions really were, and was it to share this land, and was it about an, an alliance, um, which you don't really get by reading it. You, you, you don't get the power of that alliance. I think it does, when I visited Australia, when I was in Victoria, mm -hmm. talking about when Batman gets there, and he just goes, if this is my land, right? Yes. And people, a woman made a comment that was, inappropriate. And it was just like we're talking about the language of this and how they're describing folks, but how they have it like precisely written where the, the marks will be or what they've traded and this and that to the other, that when people are, when you're wanting to be protected or you're still fighting for your piece of land, that, that trade-off is if I share with you, if I'm, you're protecting me, then I'm protected from the Pequot to continue mm -hmm. to attack, right? right? So that's their trade-off. And when you're trading in land, the English have nothing to give them besides mm. protection. Right. They don't have any, they don't have any goods, they don't have any way to they know nothing about the land when they come over here, right? They don't right. they don't right. have to maintain the land. Yeah. So it's an it's an uneven sort of it well obviously an uneven deal that's happening, but this is any land that's been colonized around the world. Mm. You're talking about too, when you're speaking to going over and taking from indigenous folks anywhere, it's the same. It's the same story, the same concept. of someone showing up, and we're going to protect you because you already have your infighting going on, so you're looking for an ally. Mm -hmm. and it mm. doesn't work out. It's so interesting. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. When was this written? When? 1670. And so, like, Europeans have been here for quite a long time by now. Well, it's like one generation, um, 35 yeah. years. And then, yeah. like, traders and. and mm -hmm. traders longer, trade yep. And, you know, a lot longer before that. But I'm not sure. I mean, certainly the concept of land ownership is totally different, as far right. as I know, in. Mm, most indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this concept of what it means to give land, mm -hmm. I don't know if that's still true in 1860, sorry, 1670, but that certainly would have been true at some point, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, what a mismatch, meaning like, 
what I think is bad. I saw that I, I know I, like some records that I've seen for Farmington, the Farmington area, mm. were exactly like that. Like, uh -huh. we'll take this, and we'll take this, and we'll take this, and we'll take this. Mm -hmm. and, we'll take this. and then we'll keep yeah. taking. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have a few things from Farmington, which I'll show a little bit later. Do you know, the blur, when Kim speaks, it does sort of make your mind in a shift because we're so European in our thinking. Yeah. The blur, the blobs, where there was all that overlap, mm -hmm. the words don't mean as much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. so interesting. Yes, yeah, speak, yes. Yeah. part of the story. Mm -hmm. right. right. And there's always was communal land. So, and then one of the things that happens is that sick young people continue to survive, but they go and live with the tunxis. So they're sort of subsumed in, into the tunxis, uh, but they hold communal land there. They don't live communally as sick young anymore, but they live as tunxis. And then the Quinnipiac also come up, but they sort of have separate land, so they continue to live communally, the Quinnipiac. Can we skip that? So that was 1670. 1671, uh, the people in Hartford divide up uh, the land that's the West Division, which becomes this land here. Um, and so I think that must have been the impetus for getting that treaty on paper. Um, to, uh, to divide up this land. And the one that's underlined here is uh, Lieutenant Robert Webster, who is the fourth uh, grandfather of Noah Webster. Um, and so he is getting this land in 1670. Noah Webster's born in 1758. Um, he, he does not inherit the land, but his father does. Um, and if you look closely, the, there's a lot of you know, old uh, West Hartford names here. Um, and the, this is another version of this where they make, I think, 90 uh, pieces of land. Uh, I think there's 90. And uh, Lieutenant Webster is number 59. And so he gets his piece of land. And then um, a little bit later, I think probably because he fought in the King Philip's War, he's given 300 more acres. So this is one way people got paid for uh, fighting in the Indian Wars. Um, and uh, this just shows, uh, this is the guy, this is the guy who gets the land. Um, and then uh, this is the guy uh, so that's his son, and then the next one down builds this house. Um, and then his father, Noah Webster Sr., who's, who owns this house, obviously, when Noah Webster is born. And so we could say that this really is on the land of the Sikiog people. You know, right. Yeah. So yeah. Okay, so uh, what happens once this land is ceded? And uh, the Sikiog really do, it seems, move uh, to Farmington. And, um, uh, but there's, uh, it, it's really interesting because I've done a lot of work studying people who are enslaved here and the relationship between enslaved people and the colonizers, their enslavers, and the native people and the colonial government are, are quite different. But quite early on, um, the Sikiog learned how to use the legal system. And I have to say, this document um, is, I feel like it's the most compelling one uh, that I found. Uh, so it says, Mary McCompass, this may inform whom it may concern that the Indian woman called Mary McCompass doth declare that she hath not, nor will not, give her young girl she had by Mingo Thomas Olmsted's Negro to any English man, but doth give her unto an Indian woman that is her cousin <laughs> called Sarah. And also, she saith, she giveth unto her daughter two acres and a half of land, now improved by Robert Shirley, when the time is out that he hath hired it, which is two years more. This is in 1692. So this woman fears that when she dies, 
her daughter is going to be taken by the Europeans and, and made an indentured servant. Um, and so she's looking ahead and writing this down so that her, um, her cousin is able to take this girl in. Um, be be yes, slave. yes, because uh, her her daughter is biracial, right? Uh, she's a Sikiog, and her father is uh, of African descent, and so um, this paper is to try and guarantee her daughter freedom. Um, so I just think it's really powerful that um, she knew the legal system and her circumstance well enough to say, uh, I got to write this down. Can I ask this question? How do you find this? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I think I actually found this uh, from the Native Northeast website portal. Um, but uh, if you go back, it's in, um, this is, um, colonial historians would call this man wearing. Uh, so this guy, uh, in 1904, he just collected all the probate records. And so um, this is all online now, so you can search it. Oh. Um, Sorry. No, that's OK. But notable here is Stephen Hosmer. Because Stephen Hosmer was one of the first English settlers here. Um, and he settled in um, right by the American School for the Deaf. Um, if you know, they just replaced that bridge there. Do you remember that? And um, if you look to the left, if you're going north, um, there was a mill pond there and a grist mill there. And Stephen Hosmer was the owner of that grist mill. And this Hosmer family, we've actually studied a lot because their family over three generations enslaved um, 18 people. And so um, he's witnessing this. Wow. Um, so I don't know if I, if I trust Stephen Hosmer. <laughs> Tracy. Yes. Sarah was Yuri's cousin. Uh, was she free? Yes. She was free. Yes, because and she. Her daughter is Sarah. Yeah. And her daughter is. I guess we don't know that her daughter's name. Are they buried or did they live on the property of Hosmer? Of Hosmer's property? Yes. I don't know. I'm not sure we can know that. Yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking he absorbed all. Yeah. Yeah. But but that had to be the fear, right? Yeah. Exactly. Because um, if we look at this next, uh, this is a an addendum to a will from uh, New London, a man named John Prentice, whose daughter Ann Prentice. Um, marries um, uh, a Hosmer um, and lives in that same area. It's not Stephen Hosmer, but a descendant. And in this, uh, uh, John Prentice is uh, saying that uh, he has a woman, an Indian woman named Rachel, um, who's had seven children. And she had these seven children by a man named Adam, who was African and was enslaved by the minister of the church in New London. And so there are these seven biracial children. And one of them uh, is given, oh darn it. Uh, one of them is given to Thomas Hosmer. So that's his son-in-law. And the promise is made that when she turns 30, she'll be free. So this woman, again, is biracial. Right? She's, uh, Rachel is uh, 10 years old when she is indentured to John Prentice um, at the end of, the, of King Philip's War. And uh, they were not to be made, uh, they were not to be considered legally as slaves, as enslaved, in that their children would not uh, be enslaved when they were born. Uh, but you can see here, in fact, uh, 
they were. Um, and so uh, Simone ends up in West Hartford. And um, she, uh, you can see that arrow goes to where the Hosmer property is. Um, and where's the, that's the grist mill there, right in there? Yeah, the grist mill would be in here. And, uh, that's like the school for the deaf, right? That's yes, the school. yeah. Okay. And so um, Simone and her two brothers end up uh, living here. Um, and so I wonder, you know, might they have known Mary McCompass? And they would be in the same, sort of the same status as uh, having a, a, a native mother and an, an enslaved father, um, and who's free and who's not free, and how do you guarantee that, and do you have this paper with you? That's what always I think of with Simone, is she goes from New London to here, and does she still have the paper? Um, and we never, we don't know that Simone is ever uh, freed, but we know that Hannibal was freed. Um, he was freed in like 1777 when he, uh, you know, he, when he was an old man. Um, and um, I just have this purple arrow here because this is where John Whitman lived. And the next section, I'm going to talk about John Whitman. And you, they lived across the street from each other, the Hosmers and the Whitmans. OK. And then this section, um, I guess I would say this is, what am I doing? OK. Um, that this is where I first started to collect uh, slides on indigenous people, is this uh, account book, which is at the Connecticut Historical Society. And this man, John Whitman, uh, was a merchant. And he traded, and at first when I was looking at it, uh, I was interested in the fact that he traded with enslaved people here. Uh, a man named Page, a man named Lou. Uh, so, uh, you know, it lists them, it says Page Negro, and then it will say, you know, they traded for cloth and how much, and then how they paid him back. But then as I went back and looked at it again, I found that he had traded with all of these uh, people who are usually labeled as Farmington Indians. So this is a puzzle, right? Like, what, what is John Whitman? How is he? Um, why is this happening? And it turns out that John Whitman's father is a man named Samuel Whitman who lived in Farmington. And he was the minister of the church in Farmington. And in the 1730s, the church in Farmington began an Indian school to teach uh, young boys English and to become Christians. And so it's really a Christian school. And so the Tunxists uh, are Christianized. Um, and so uh, John Whitman has this connection to his father to the Tunxists who live in uh, Farmington. And so this is what it looks like when you go to read it, which, and it's, uh, uh, you know, the more you read it, the easier it gets. But uh, you can see on the top, uh, the top one, oh, sorry. Oops. How did I do that? OK. The top one is um, Cornelius Indian, two dozen pipes. And then there's this guy, and I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. It's spelled a bunch of different ways, but I think it's Wampy. Um, he was one of their leaders, so he traded a lot with John Whitman. Um, and then, um, unlike among the English, there were lots of women who traded. Uh, so Sarah Robin, um, and then uh, this has um, a woman named Anne. And one of the interesting things about Anne, this is just a transcription, is that she promised to pay in brooms and Indian corn in two months. So she was getting cloth from him, mostly. Um, and ribbon, and then uh, she was paying in brooms and Indian corn. And here's another one with Wampy. Um, uh, so um, there was quite an active trade. And then I thought, well, did they come here or did he go there? I don't know. Um, but 
uh, there were a couple things I read which made me think he went to Farmington. Uh, and here's another set of them as well. And you can see here, uh, um, received uh, baskets and brooms. So they were buying stuff and then, so they were part of this economy. Tracy, he probably had a horse and they didn't, so it's easy for him. <laughs> maybe. Maybe, you're, maybe that's right. Yeah. yeah. All those little numbers on the other pages, like what were they counting? Um, well, it's, it's pounds, shillings, and pence is what they're. Um, were they actually paying money? No, they just value it, and then they bring them the broom, and they value the broom, and then they, you know, and then if it's, like some of them, you can see, do you see here where it's X'd out? That means they've, um, they've taken care of their debt. You see the X's down the, so they've made, uh, they've made their piece. It's just odd to keep track of what you lost, but not what you gained. I mean... Well, I, I think the X is a sign that they've been paid. Yeah, but I mean, wouldn't you want to know what? Yeah, that it was more detailed. And some of them it is. Yes, like the brooms uh, are noted in several places. Yeah, it's just like, wait a minute, what did they do with all this? Mm -hmm. Didn't they want to write it down somewhere? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Maybe they had double books back then. Yeah, I wonder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so somebody mentioned before, I think it was Kim, that um, there's a lot of research that has been done on the tungsus in Farmington. And there's something now called the Native Northeast Portal, which used to be the Yale Indian Papers. Um, and so now um, this guy, Paul Costa, has, uh, well, Yale sort of said, we don't want to do the Yale Indian Papers anymore. And so they've made this new portal, uh, the Native Northeast Portal, which is just... Uh, it's so amazing. Um, but this is a map they've drawn of Farmington, and this area here was called Indian Neck. This was really good land. And as you read through all these documents, you see there's all this conflict over who has this land. And, is that like Meadow Lane now? Um, this is, um, well, I would say that this is where, um, what are the fields called? Tungsus Mead? Oh, yeah. Uh, are there. This is the Pequabic River here. So this is sort of whittled away. And then this land is divided into, um, it's really a reservation, and they divide the land up. So they basically take away the communal land, and they say each of you will own individual land. And then you can click on this, and uh, if you look at this, do you see where it says Cornelius Indian? So he's one of the people John Whitman traded with. Um, and so you can click, on, the map is interactive, and you click on the house, and then it tells you who, who lives there. So one of the things, I just recently was able to talk to Paul Costa, and um, it's really fascinating having studied a lot of uh, people who were enslaved here. There was a lot of um, intermarriage um, among the Tunxes and the people who were enslaved, um, but they really focused on um, the Tunxis, and so they don't really know those connections, um, and so it's really been interesting talking to him about, uh, about those connections. The Tunxis end up uh, leaving Farmington in the 1770s. Um, they're Christianized, and they realize they're not going to be able to keep this land, and they go to Brothertown, New York, um, and they become the Brothertown tribe, so it's the Tunxis, the Quinnipiac, um, those are the two big ones here, but there are others involved. And, um, and then from there, they go to Wisconsin because um, they're pushed out of New York as well. But one of the interesting things that Paul told me was when they left, they did not allow any biracial people to go with them. They only took people who were of native blood. Um, and this is... Uh, how they divided the land up. So you can look really closely and see all the different people, many of whom traded with John Whitman. So what responsibility do we have? So we, we know something now about who lived here. And uh, many of you will remember uh, this uh, f um, 
uh, reckoning uh, with the um, with the uh, mascots uh, in town, and um, uh, it's really just been resolved in the last couple of years. Though uh, you these, can still find them. you can still find them around. Um, and while this was going on, uh, my friend Liz Devine and I um, had uh, arranged for this guy, Frank Wallen, who was a Lakota Sioux, um, and he's a hip hop artist, to come and speak to the students. And uh, he came uh, with these, uh, these men who were uh, dancers. And when he came, he said he was afraid to come here after he heard about um, the discussion of the mascots. And I don't know if you remember this, but there were fan groups. So one fan group at Hall was called The Reservation. And he actually asked the kids, so what reservation did you grow up on? You know, like where? Uh, um, and he, he really changed a lot of um, kids' minds. Uh, but, you know, he really expressed a fear for walking in these high schools because of what he'd heard and because of what was going on. Um, this. Uh, I was really surprised to find, <laughs> I have to say. But this is uh, the 2023 website of Wampanoag Country Club. This is what you get when you pull it up on the computer. And shockingly, it says, you are home. Oh uh, it's really quite something. Uh, so, you know, I just think about the you know, what, what are we doing here now? And um, I did contact a person who I, I think belonged, uh, belongs to the club, and he said, oh, we don't think about it a lot, but I'd be happy to talk on the phone to you about it. So I haven't I done that yet. I'm happy to talk to the president about, like, <laughs> the club president. <laughs> yeah, but that hasn't, uh, that hasn't happened yet, but I was really, I have to say, I was surprised. I mean, I knew that Wampanoag was called Wampanoag, but I didn't know they had a mascot. And, it, and it's interesting, too, because Northwest, which used to have a mascot, was mm -hmm. right across the street, and, and they, they changed they the changed. mascot before West Hartford. Mm -hmm. the yeah, they did. Do you think the country club would get the idea? Yeah, from but they, they have not. 2023. Do you know why they have that why they chose it in the first place? You know, it, it's interesting, Gail, because if you look at the 1920s and the 1950s, there was a reckoning with Native Americans in the country. And so like in 1924, Native Americans were made citizens of the United States. And so people were sort of paying attention. Um, and in the 1950s, uh, there were attempts to, uh, to uh, get rid of all reservations and have Native people assimilate into American culture, and, um, and also to urbanize uh, Native people, too, to have them move into cities. Um, and I guess that would take me to the next slide, which is there are a lot of street names in West Hartford that are um, named after Native people. And um, it's sort of arbitrary to me, because it's not like they're named Niantic or, or they're named uh, you know, by names of Algonquin names that are here, but they're sort of random uh, you know, Blackhawk, Arapaho, Pontiac. They're not people who lived in the area that is now Connecticut. So there are um, a few that are local. Um, and it seems one thing we might do is have a place on our a town website where we describe uh, the history of these, um, these names. And notice we do have Tonksis. Um, and uh, I, I was also interested to know where the Tonksis were. And so um, this is... Uh, um, from a place in Wisconsin near Fond du Lac, 
Um, and you can see here the Tonkses from Farmington, Connecticut. This is the brother town Indian nation. They do not have federal recognition. And federal recognition is based on um, uh, your identity as a people. And they have one, two, three, four, five. They have like seven different groups here. And I think that's the reason that they couldn't make the case to be. Uh, to, to get federal recognition. Uh, but they had a petition on their website to, uh, to become a federally recognized tribe. Um, and so hopefully as you look back on these questions, you could say, OK, I know a little bit more about those now um, than when I came in. and. Um, that, uh, you know, think about uh, what, what areas really need more research, um, what stories you will retell. Um, and this is just the beginning of a reckoning. Uh, what do we do to repair? And for me, as a town historian and teacher, I have ideas. Uh, I wonder if we could name a McCompass Road in our town. Could we make a connection with the brother town community in Wisconsin? Is Simone's story as compelling as Bristow's? Should there be a historical sign where the Suckyog settlement was? How do we interpret John Whitman's account book and weave in his role as an enslaver and town and church leader? The story is complicated. And this complexity is what will help make us whole. Um, so thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, I can do that. I, I think the best way is if you gave me your email, or I don't know if somehow the Noel Webster House could do that, but I'm happy to send them to you if you just want to give me your email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can That's I right. just, before we quit for the night, I, I would love to just put some ideas and add to that nice sure. list of ideas. So I'm an environmental educator, right? Um, I teach children and adults as well. Um, Like, there is so many um, parts of the, the, I mean, the culture. While we have erased these, these cultures, I mean, certainly naming them is a great, important thing. And, and, and you know, I think at some point there's a, a, going to be a talk about land acknowledgement. It's a big Thursday. topic. Yep. Great. Um, so that's so important. But, um, I, I know, like, you brought up the high school thing, and I'm, I have children in different schools, and, I, and there's just generally so much antipathy still in our town about, you know, indifference as well. And so what I can tell you is so real is that the climate emergency that our town has even acknowledged mm -hmm. um, demands that we understand the whole identity of most if not all of the indigenous cultures of North, you know, this North American land and beyond, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. but this and, and definitely the indigenous cultures of this land, the way they connected to the whole living world, the way you know humans were not at the top as they are for our Western culture, and it's, I mean, it's frankly is a key part of what's harming all of us so greatly in creating this like unsustainable future. So, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, and I'm rambling, but I mean, can we, can we, you know, make sure at least where we are able, let's highlight that, you know, this knowledge that we did our best to erase is actually, is, is a key part of what will save us. If we are bold enough to, and, and not, you know, willing and able to learn um, because, yeah, this, like, it's like owning the land. It's like, well, how can you own land? It's, it's itself. It's its own body. It's a being, you know? How can it's like owning a being? You can't mm -hmm. do that either, right? And so there's so many things that we could talk about that might give our citizens real tools to clean our land, air, and water. 
and it's I it's all from these indigenous culture. It's it's, it's it really is, you know. Um, and so let's I don't know help me get start that conversation and keep it going, you know. <laughs> and so we at Westmore Park, I teach at Westmore Park, you know. We satisfy the science curriculum for elementary school. I mean, not every grade, I think. You guys tell me I'm not a classroom teacher. But uh, we satisfy the science curriculum. But it's really, we're doing so much more than satisfying the science curriculum. We are, you know, we are offering a piece, respectfully, we hope, of this history that has been raised. And so we're, we're doing our part, but it could be so much bigger. It could be education for our grown-ups as well, families. So I, think I think you've just nominated yourself to join our task force. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm leading a, a sustainable land care working group for the Sustainable well, Land Care Commission. commission. Yeah, it's, it's, the the same same work. Work. it's the same yeah. work. You know, mm -hmm. That's what I want to say. Well, you know? okay. I was saying that I'm going to say that that is a bridge because indigenous people, their practice was basically land, air, water. And it has like a sustainability component and tie it. The, the, I mean, if you don't, I'm sorry if you, if I'm repeating something you know, but I mean, they, they have kinship, true kinship, like sisters and brothers. They would never say, for example, put pesticides on soil um, and kill everything to make a beautiful lawn. For example, well, I think you bring, just you bring up a sense. great point, though, that you know, and we're just starting like this year trying to get this off the ground and. There's so much potential for partnership of oh, a lot of groups in town mm -hmm. and all of you here, you know, and, and it's good, I think, for us to think big, like, you know, think of these important and obvious connections between environment and indigenous practices. And, They're like, and it's um, like this. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's all, it's all interesting. I, I would love to help in any way possible, for sure. Okay. Gail, I think you had a question. Oh, I was just wondering, do we know what the indigenous population of residents are in this town, 0.01%. So. Yeah, it's like, I think it may be 180 people. I think if you multiply that out. I think it's 0.01%. Yeah. Yeah. So I identify with the census that most parts of the So it wouldn't be that, maybe 60 then. I think the rest of the people are going to Well, I didn't prepare any more Thank you, Tracy. I think that there's um, some side conversations to have over cheese and crackers because we've got lots of it left. And I'm just, just going to ask Adrian if she might come up and just highlight some of the other events yeah, uh, that are happening this oh, great. week. Are you still taking this? I'm going to have to use the microphone. Good evening, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Adrian Blumstead. I am our equity coordinator for the town of West Hartford um, and one of the individuals on our town staff. And I have to write a rep, Brian Hammer, who is also uh, a town employee who has been doing this work with me and our task force members. Um, I want to say thank you for our task force. I want to say thank you to Tracy Wilson, who did an excellent job. <laughs> this put together by a group of very committed individuals. Um, everyone did their part to make sure that we were recognizing, we're doing the recognition piece now. The reconciliation piece comes after this because we wanted to ensure that we were educating our community because we heard those, um, those uh, voices who said, I didn't know enough, why are we doing this? And we did have the goal of land acknowledgement. And as the group spoke, we said, no, we're going to educate people. We're going to bring people to the table. We're going to allow people to have their voice heard so that they can get some questions answered. Um, and the group really made sure every piece was met. So yesterday, we did have um, a talk, Marcy Rendon, um, with the, the library. And we brought in other partners. I would like to say thank you to UConn, AASI, um, the Noah Webster House, the, the, the uh, West Hartford Public Libraries, um, and also, who am I missing? First, first and First Church. 
wonderful partners and sponsors who believe in this work. Um, so yesterday we had an author talk with a Native American author. Tonight, obviously, we had Dr. Tracy Wilson give us a little bit of history. Um, her, her project, it's a work in progress, but it's so rich and beneficial when you have people in the room and people watching um, to hear where their land comes from, what they are on, who they should be honoring. Um, I think that's so important, but also um, wanting to learn more. And that's what we should be always be thriving and, and, and striving to do is learn more about who we are um, as a resident of West Hartford, um, as an American, as an immigrant um, who lives on this uh, soil. But anyways, tomorrow we have um, a beating project at the, in the Children's uh, Library from 3.30 to 4.45. 4.15. I always want it to be a little longer, so I keep telling you. <laughs> Till the 4.15, um, and that's for grades 3 through 6. On Thursday, we have our discussion. Hmm? That's it? Yeah. On Thursday, we have um, our discussion um, with Lauren Spears, um, who is an amazing expertise, I would say. Um, who's... I'm going to go back a little bit. We didn't want this to be political. We wanted this to be about our town and our people and what it really looked like when you make these statements. And statements are just that words, but when you put them into action and how you can be a part of those statements. So Lauren Spears, um, who is, uh, will be virtual on WHCI, you can register, and that's from 7 to 8 p.m. And on Saturday, we have the Thunderbird dancers coming in at 2.30 at the First Church um, on South Main. So um, we're really happy, grateful for all of our members. We're grateful that you guys came out and the people watching, and we hope to see you at more events this week. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all, and welcome to enjoy the museum for a few minutes.